when we got interviewed for that great project in Des Moines for a Blue Cross Blue Shield, we were interviewed by the board of directors and the head of the board of directors said, uh, what kind of monument could you design for us? <laughs> and I'll go a decade without arguing with anybody. I, I, I'm not an arguing kind of guy. And I said, well, actually, I don't think you need a monument. <laughs> I think here people are paying for Blue Cross Blue Shield, paying really hard on money, and the salary level in your headquarters is pretty low. And the idea of having a monument just doesn't seem right to me. If you ask me if we can design a really fine building for your employees that will be efficient and that people would love to work there, I'd say, yeah, we're, we're on. We'll work our butts off to get that done. So the chairman sort of dismissed all of that. We were with local architects in Des Moines. And so the, our meeting was finally over and then they took us to the airport. And we said, well, obviously we're not going to get that job. And we got on the plane and left, but we did get that job. The CEO, who came to be a very close friend, uh, said, that was exactly right. We, we don't need a monument. We need something that's really helpful, and we'd like for it to be helpful and to look like it's helpful, not look like it's extravagant. And I think HOK has done a few really extravagant things, but most of HOK's signal projects are important because they're not extravagant, but just trying to be helpful. We've always, and especially Patrick and I, have always wanted our things to literally be helpful to the people that were using them and not, not just some stuff, which is extremely common in today's world of big architecture. My name is Mark Arlapage. And I'm joined by Patrick McLaney, FAIA, and former CEO of the international architecture firm, HOK. This is Build Smart. Patrick shares stories from his remarkable 50-year career at HOK, rising from junior designer to CEO of the company. With themes of leadership, finance, people, culture, and so much more, you'll find that there's a lesson in every episode. Welcome back to Build Smart. We left off with George Helmuth, Guy Obata, and George Kassebaum finally coming together and forming HOK. We also touched on Patrick's arrival at HOK, and he detailed what the firm was like at the time. The innovation of the practice that was occurring, the vibrant firm culture, and the strong commitment to growth. If you haven't yet listened to that episode, I encourage you to go back and listen to all the episodes in order to hear Patrick's full story and insights into how to design a world-class architecture firm. Today's episode is especially important for firm leaders and young people in the profession to listen to as Patrick lays out his early career experiences, learning about leadership and his growth within one firm, HOK. I want to start off this episode with your early career experience. What was it like and what did you learn in those early days? Actually, you know, Helmus adage about attracting and keeping young people. I didn't know it at the time, but I was a perfect example of what he was speaking of. I was a young man. I had grown up near St. Louis. I didn't really want to stay there my whole career. I had the idea that I would work there a couple of years, get some good experience, take my license exam, get licensed, and then go west. What I found that kept me there was continuing new challenges, a place to grow up not just to grow a little bit in experience and then leave to go somewhere else. And uh, that was a different experience than what I had imagined. I would never have imagined, never, staying in, my, uh, in one place my entire career. And it was because of the firm that HOK was and the attitude they had about attracting and keeping young people and giving them a chance to grow up in the firm. I started as a junior designer, as I've said before, and I worked on one big project that was a series of new high schools for Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, flew back and forth with my immediate boss, Bill Valentine, and sometimes with Guy Obata and others back and forth to Pittsburgh for meetings. And when the project got into production after design development, Bill Valentine and Guy asked me, 
to move to Pittsburgh to be the design eyes and ears for Valentine and, and Obata in Pittsburgh. So I did that and uh, actually found it a delightful experience. We had not one associate architect in Pittsburgh, but four. And these four firms, local firms in Pittsburgh, plus some of us from HOK in St. Louis, developed a project office, and that's where I worked for the next year. And it was a great experience for me, number one, to understand how the design gets carried out during production or working drawings, something I didn't actually have that depth of experience in before. So how does it work when you have a design and you want to carry it out and the inevitable conflicts and difficulties of carrying the design out technically arise? So it was a great experience for me. Plus, I loved Pittsburgh. Most people think of it as a smelly old steel mining, a steel producing town rather, but it wasn't. The steel mills were gone. Pittsburgh emerged from the, the steel mill dust and, and smoke as a beautiful city, hilly, where two rivers, the Allegheny and the Monongahela rivers joined to form the Ohio River. So it was a breathtaking city. And actually, when I look back on it, I could have stayed there. I liked Pittsburgh. I liked the environs. Falling water was nearby. And as a young architect, I was told to really appreciate that project, the beauty of Frank Lloyd Wright's creation. You had to visit Falling Water in all four seasons. And I managed to do that while I was in Pittsburgh. That was one of the real highlights. So uh, again, I was even thinking about, well, maybe I'll just stay here after the project is finished and go to work for one of these local four firms that we were working with, or maybe start my own firm. That was not going to happen. Why didn't you stay in Pittsburgh? Well, Bill Valentine and I were avid racquetball players. We started playing when I came to St. Louis, and there were a group of people that would go to the local Y and play racquetball. And Bill Valentine and I continued that when I moved to Pittsburgh. We both joined the local Y there and played racquetball every time Bill Valentine would visit. And one time Bill was there and he was playing racquetball with me. And after the game, uh, we were both sitting there bathed in sweat in the locker room. And Bill said, say, Gio's got me going back and forth to San Francisco because we've got an office there, a little project office that he wants to turn into a full service office, a permanent office. So I wonder, would you like to help me with that workload? Bill, you mean move to San Francisco? Yes, move to San Francisco. Well, Mark, I had never been west of Denver, and I had a hazy idea about what California was like. I, I knew from watching the Rose Bowl on television that it was certainly warmer there on New Year's Day than it was where I lived in St. Louis or Pittsburgh. And so I said, well, sure. Well, first, uh, Patrick and I, I met Patrick because he came to HOK working on this uh, great high schools project in Pittsburgh. He was a designer then. And one of the sites was a very difficult site and uh, I mean, it was just a steep hill site. And imagine trying to get a high school on this site. And Patrick took this thing home overnight or over a weekend. And he came back with this beautiful solution, just so elegant and so simple. And that really got my attention about Patrick. I thought, wow, this is one really smart guy. I really had my eye on him as being a really smart, thoughtful, hardworking, HOK loving guy. Bill Valentine, FAIA, and former CEO of HOK, met with Patrick to chat about their time together at the firm, including his perspective on getting Patrick relocated from Pittsburgh to San well, Francisco. One day, Gio Obata called me into his office and said, I'd like for you to move to San Francisco to be a design lead for a new office we're going to open there. But by the way, uh, could you leave in the morning and go to Alaska and talk to uh, our Alaska friends at HOK? had just acquired this office in Alaska and the work was going to be done predominantly in San Francisco. Whatever Gio said we did, if you said, you know, I really think you should cut off an arm. He said, well, fine. Would you prefer the left arm or the right arm? Because we, Gio was just like God. So I said, uh, well, sure. That'd be great, Gio. And I was sitting there thinking and I thought, well, well, there is one thing, Gio. Could I possibly take Patrick 
McLamey, Patrick Lamey it was then. That's right. Uh, with me. And I can't remember if he told me on the spot. Well, and Bill, what I remember is that you had to kind of con him into it. That he said, well, you know, I think we've been giving too many people from St. Louis away to start these new offices. And I don't want to give any more designers away. <laughs> and, and I was in Pittsburgh. Right. Yeah, you exactly. Said, well, you said, well, Patrick, Patrick's in Pittsburgh. So he's really not in St. Louis. Would that make it okay? <laughs> And he kind of looked at you and, and said, well, I guess so. And so on that very tenuous acceptance by Gio, I was on my way to San Francisco. Mark, again, I didn't know what San Francisco was like, so I asked some of my colleagues in the Pittsburgh office. And uh, one of them said, well, you know, the buildings are all white and pink and pastel colors. They're not gray and they're not brick. And the water in the bay and in the ocean is deep blue. It's not brown like the Mississippi or the Ohio River. I couldn't quite grasp what that meant until finally the day came in the spring of 1970 that I flew to San Francisco and landed at the airport, rented a car, and there I was, no, no GPS, just paper maps, finding my way toward the office and eventually looking for a place to live. I found myself crossing the Golden Gate Bridge. It was a beautiful spring day, I think it was May, and the sky was so deep blue, if you touched it, I thought it was like fine china, you could break it, you would shatter. The water was an even deeper blue, and from the view of the bridge, this magnificent bridge, the city looked as if it was shimmering on the water of the bay. It was just a, I had never seen anything like it. So I drove, Across the bridge, looking for a place to live, and Bill had suggested Mill Valley. Mill Valley is actually a village at the base of a mountain, Mount Tamalpais. And I missed the turn. He said, there's a certain spot where you can go get a weekly newspaper and look for houses for rent. Well, I missed the turn and I ended up in a redwood grove. There was a big redwood tree right in the middle of the road and the road split to go around this tree. I, I could not believe what I was seeing, the magnificence of these beautiful trees. I was so impressed, I stopped the car, got out, walked up to this tree and touched it just to be sure it was real. It wasn't a hard bark, it was a fibrous soft bark. But this tree was, I don't know, 150, 200 feet tall, probably six feet across at the base. I had never seen anything so beautiful. And I said, I'm home, this is it for me. <laughs> So began working in a little office in San Francisco, a little rented space, actually a storefront. And within three weeks, Bill Valentine came out again and said, we have to go to Anchorage. So they put a ticket in my hand and off we went to Anchorage. Every time I got an itchy foot, HOK opened a new door for me, allowed me to grow within the firm, allowed me to move around geographically because now there was a first office outside of St. Louis that was the first of many, many others. So I had choices within HOK. I didn't have to leave in order to exercise my choices. And when you went to San Francisco, you were a designer. You were a designer from day one. Gio hired you to be his guy, to be a designer, right? That's right. And you went to Pittsburgh as a designer, and then you went to San Francisco as a designer but you didn't stay a designer, right? What? No, I didn't. I was a designer in San Francisco for a number of years and enjoyed it. And there are some buildings in San Francisco that um, I'm proud to say I was the designer for. But then uh, I got involved in criminal justice work. That sounds like, well, why would you want to do that? Well, because it was really interesting, exciting work. People who get into trouble with the law and are put in jail or people have to go to court, they're people. And I learned all about how that process works because one of the leaders in the office was very well engaged with justice work. It was part of George Helmuth's diversification effort. We don't just design schools, we design everything, including jails and prisons and courthouses. In the recent years, behind a rising awareness of racial disparities, there's been a growing movement for criminal justice reform in the United States. Within that movement, 
there have been calls from some in the architectural community for architects to decline prison projects. Bill and Patrick spent some time in their conversation discussing this subject. About that. I think working on jails and prisons in the right circumstance is a terrific thing. And the whole idea that architects wouldn't do it, I think, is a travesty. Let's talk about all the, the people who are involved in that. Let's talk about the prisoners, the, the people who are living there. If you can actually make that a better, safer, more wholesome environment, great, go for it. If you can make it better for the staff, great, go for it. If you can make it so government money is spent more wisely and not wasted, so it's a wholesome place, great, go for it. So this, this whole notion of not doing it seems horrible to me. I think it's a very short-sighted for people to tell architects to turn down prison work. You know, the people that are in prison, because it's they're not going to be empty. They're people. And a good architect that really gets at the proper design thinking about prison design can actually make much more wholesome environments for the people that are forced to live there. And at HOK, we always had the idea that every project is an opportunity to do something good, even if it's a prison. And so from time to time, yes, we've had architects inside the firm that said, I don't want to design prisons. Well, that's okay. But both Bill and I did. And uh, we think that the world's a little better place because of our involvement. For everything that you give a chance to do, if you put in the forefront to enrich people's lives, that's what we need to do. Now, how do you do that? You start designing, you start trying to save money, you start trying to save land, you start trying to be helpful. And that we believed that that would go to make a really good firm, but it's substance, its beginning is to be helpful. That, that's the beginning of the whole thing. They pondered what would happen if architects did refuse prison work. Well, I think what would happen is people are going to work out a strategy called design if you want to, those kind of projects. And so you get less quality and so on. So I, I think it, it would be unfortunate, as we said before, it's better to take those things on and make them something good. So I, I think it's not a step in the right direction socially at all. It's a step in the wrong direction socially. Or clients are going to say, maybe we'll figure out how to do this with just the engineers. Somebody will figure out a way around it. And if I could just get on my little soapbox, <laughs> way too much of our built environment is done without good design. Way too much already. Where people say, architects are too expensive. When they work on your projects, your projects end up costing more and maybe don't work so well. That's a favorite of Valentine's. <laughs> and my wish is that we could insert good design into every nook and cranny of our built environment and not play games with denying ourselves. The world needs us and we're running away from the world's needs too much as architects. For the aspiring firm owners, they also shared their thoughts on how to approach controversial topics and public opinion. The world really needs what I think we're espousing here. And if you just let everything calm down a little bit and really listen to what the world needs, it isn't to stop designing prisons or defund the police. It's where the setting of the world is much more carefully designed, regardless of what it is, because all of this design work is for people. I think stay the course, don't get caught up too much in the moment. Designing and, and building a firm is a long decades process. And uh, you have to have some staying power and you have to have a core belief system. And in the case of HOK, it's something like every project is a design opportunity, everyone, no matter what it is. And every project is for people. There are people who are going to use the project or live in it or walk by it. And that's the essence of it. If we do our jobs right, the world will be a better place. And I think it took 50 years to prove that. But over the, all those years, that's a very good business strategy because opening your mind to all sorts of different things, because you never can tell when something is going to be really important. You think of it as, oh, yeah, okay, we'll just get this done. And then all of a sudden, it just becomes 
wildly important. So why turn down something? As long as you have a moral compass about doing it, so you're doing it to be helpful, then let's go for it. The architect, if you want to be a leader, maybe you have to take some courage and show the way and say, well, no, I'm not going to refrain from designing prisons. I'm going to design the very best, most useful, efficient places for people to live, because that's where you have to live if you're in prison. And it's going to be the best I can make it. And you show an integrity and a positive nature as an architect instead of just listening to the crowd. I think it takes courage to be a great architect and to do things that aren't always viewed as the right things, but over time can be great treasures. So I got engaged with the office in helping to do what are called criminal justice studies. You don't just design a jail, you do a study for a county or a city or a state that determines need. And then if the need is there and it's demonstrated, then you, you might get the chance to design something. So I got very involved in these and the leaders around the office found that I was pretty good at it. It involved meeting people. It involved being in meetings often uh, with the public where the public is unhappy with something about we don't want a jail or we do want a jail. So I began to run these projects myself with less and less supervision from the office. And some of them were successfully completed and I became the designer of a new courthouse or a new county jail, but others were just studies. But I began to realize how much interest I had in successfully running something myself and finishing on time and creating a report, making a deadline and making a little profit on the fee that we had. So gradually and without actually consciously realizing it, I became more and more interested in project performance. Can we finish by the deadline? Can we keep the client happy with our results? Can we deliver buildings, uh, pro projects that, are, uh, that fit the, the budget? And uh, I think that was always inside of me, even though I wanted to be a designer. I also was always a very organized person from a young age. So a natural evolution occurred where I became really interested in this. And, you know, Mark, if you're interested in something and you're given an opportunity to let your interest mature, you can evolve into something else. We were not all going to be designers. So I became a de facto manager of small projects at first and then larger. And finally, the day came that Bill Valentine and one other leader in the office pulled me into Bill's office and said, Patrick, we've been noticing you and you've turned into a very good young project manager. And it seems to us that this may be your real calling. We want you to think about whether you would like to change at this point, because your design is still good. If you want to be a designer, we're not going to tell you you cannot. But if you decide that you want to be a project manager, we will support that and you can manage, but you'll be at a fork in the road. You can't do both. I think we sort of thought together that management was going to be a higher calling for Patrick. If we really loved HOK and we were going to try to do the best for HOK, Having somebody who loved design and who understood design, design being how we actually solve problems for clients in the management side was a great thing because you need to understand the process. The design process is not a linear thing. It has its ups and downs and those ups and downs can't be avoided. You can help straighten that line out a little bit, but it's going to definitely have ups and downs. And if you get a manager who just thinks in a straight line and doesn't accept the idea of they're going to be gives and takes and ebbs and flows, then it's not going to work very well. And HOK's philosophy, I believe, clients come first. We got to be helpful and, and do things that are really going to be good for our clients. And, and it's not about just getting the numbers to work out. You got to look at that overall picture. And I thought Patrick could really get this whole picture about how to actually advance the institution of HOK, the institution of actually being helpful to people at large. 
I remembered well the day that you said, you know, uh, I asked you a question. I said, Bill, does this mean I won't get to design anything, be responsible for design? And you said something really important to me. You said, well, that's right. You won't be responsible for design, but as a good manager, you're the partner to the project designer and all design ideas are welcome. And that actually was as much as so I thought about it for a day or two and came back and said, well, yes, I'd like to do this. And uh, it changed my life. Being responsible all of a sudden for a team of people instead of just myself and being responsible for things like scope and schedule and budget and teamwork and client relationships was all new and very exciting for me. I took to it just almost immediately. And I did also learn that as a project manager, I still had a lot of influence over design, not the final word, but a lot of influence, which in a collaborative office, that's a good thing. It's the team that does the work, not just one individual, albeit there are individuals that lead design and individuals that lead other things. As you were telling that story, one of the things that kept coming to mind is is culture, that culture allowed you to do the traveling from Pittsburgh to San Francisco and find your place and not leave to go find that somewhere else. It sounds like it's happening very much in your position in the firm as well, where you were a designer and you found this strength, you found this part of the job interesting and they found a place for you to do that within the firm. And so the culture of HOK, which is something that other firms can learn from, is to provide these opportunities for your team to be able to find their place rather than going somewhere else to find that place. Well, you, you said it just right. I mean, uh, Helma's first principle was attract and keep talented people. And you can't keep somebody if they don't have room to grow and evolve. You just can't. If you can, if, if they're content with this one job and so for years, decades, they're probably not the people you really want or need. And the more diversified the firm becomes, the more opportunities there really are. It's an unfolding process. People in the firm began to realize, oh, I can grow up in this firm. I can become something more than I am today by specializing or by even shifting from design to something else. It's something that I think every firm that wants to not just survive, but to prosper, needs to not just keep in mind, but to build a strategy around, much like Helmuth's strategy. And you became a very good project manager. What was it about project management that you liked doing? Well, I had the wrong idea about it when I first began. I thought, oh, well, I'm the manager. And the term manager, I thought was the boss. The manager decides what to do and tells the people that's working for him or her, do this and do that, and everything gets done, and they'll, and that's how you manage. And I quickly discovered that that's not what management really is. There's a little bit of management. I don't want to demean the word totally. A manager has the responsibility for developing a schedule, for getting the work done, for developing a budget, not only for the project team to spend the client's fee budget, but also a budget for the project itself. My mantra was scope, schedule, and budget. You have to know what you're going to design and produce and the schedule to to accomplish it. And you, a good manager will make all of that work within a certain schedule so that you assure yourself of a profit. I thought that was it. Well, it turns out that was just a little fragment (laughs) of what a project manager does. What I learned is that project managing is really more about leading people than it is about managing. And I I learned this quickly. You can't manage by sitting in behind a desk or in your office and issuing commands. You manage by or lead, I, I think proper term is lead, by getting out of your office or out from behind your desk and sitting with your team or with an individual on your team and helping them to solve their whatever their challenge is. I don't know how to get this detail solved. We've got a code issue with the design. We've got a schedule problem. The client's unhappy with something. A hundred and one thousand and one things. A good leader 
doesn't just say, well, I'll take care of that. You help people understand how they can solve it themselves. As a good leader, you're as much of a mentor as you are a leader. Helping young people especially know that it's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to fail. It's not okay not to get up again and try again and solve the problem another way. So I began to to understand that, that project managers are really project leaders. Maybe there's a personnel issue that two people on the project team don't like each other, or maybe there's an issue with somebody on the client side. It's not always technical or building code or something. It's often, in fact, more and more often people, people that need to share a common point of view. So I began to think of myself as a project leader not as a project manager, and in fact, even proposed, this is a goofy name, project manager. Why don't we change it to project leader? After thinking about it for a while, we realized, well, the names project manager or managing principal are are part of the tradition of the practice. It'd be very difficult, it'd be just confusing to change it. But the words manage really do mean lead. That's what I discovered as a project manager. It was a thrilling, exciting journey to actually learn that. And it was the most thrilling when young people that were on my project began to realize that, oh, I'm free to experiment and grow and learn and make errors and be forthright about it and correct those errors. And the manager's not going to take my head off. I won't get fired. I'll get encouraged to do better the next time and learn from my errors. Project managing is a bit like parenting, where people make mistakes all the time. You're not going to throw them away just because they make mistakes. People need to learn. And so there's an environment for learning that a proper project leader or manager has to nurture. Do you have any examples of that? Any stories that you can tell about those critical opportunities to be a leader? Uh, Yes, I have hundreds, but there's one in particular that happened fairly early in my career as a project manager. HOK won the commission to design a new convention center for the city of San Francisco. That was a major breakthrough for the office because it really meant that HOK had arrived, that we were no longer the outsiders from St. Louis. We were a local firm that had won this important commission. The project that Patrick is referring to is the Moscone Center, a large convention center in San Francisco originally opened in 1981. The project was unpopular among some in the community, and to mitigate public concerns, the exhibition hall was built underground to minimize the controversial convention center's visible footprint. The challenge was then to overcome the suffocating feeling of being underground. At a young age, Patrick was the project manager of this large complex project, facing opposition from the public and a tough client. And the project was run by a very tough official in the city, Roger Boas, who was the chief executive officer of the city, basically. And uh, Boas was a tank commander under General Patton in World War II. He was a tough, salty guy that took no prisoners. It was his way or the highway. And uh, we all had our baptism of fire under Boas. To get more insight on the Moscone Center and the client perspective on projects, Patrick spoke with his now longtime friend and at the time client and assistant to the San Francisco Chief Administrative Officer, John Igo. Roger was placed in a position where he had to trust, with a capital T, the firm to be the architect for Moscone Center. And he did it in a very diligent manner. And then he took the next step when he decided he really liked the HOK approach, being down to earth, straightforward, led by Gio, who was the designer. And uh, you have a way of designing for the people, designing for the event, designing for the project, so that you could take your skills that you've developed to develop other buildings or or whatever, but apply them to public facilities. And that was really key to him. But at the the long run, it's people and the trust that he had in people. Boas 
could be a very, very tough client, very tough, very demanding, uh, because he was independently wealthy, uh, came from uh, came from money, if you might say, say uh, and he considered himself a businessman. And so he was going to take that businessman attitude and apply it to government. And the last thing I'll say about Roger was that Roger was a man of his word. And so no matter how tough he could be as a client, you had the fact that you could trust him as well. And so the, 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 thing, the charm about HOK was the fact that it was a full service architectural firm, provided the interior support, as well as they had in-house some darn good mechanical and electrical engineers. But Gio, as great an architect as he was, his challenge here was structural. And how do you get light into such a project? And so he teamed up with T.Y. Lin, and what a combo. T.Y., maybe at the time, was he was the most brilliant structural engineer around. I don't know, but he was pretty damn good. I don't know if you remember this, but I remember it vividly. T.Y. was born in China, in Shanghai, I believe. And he learned how to do his engineering calculations before the computer. And he used an abacus to do calculations. I don't know if you remember it. But yeah. when Gio and T.Y. were working on this design of these magnificent arches, I remember T.Y. took a little pocket version of this abacus out of his pocket, little thing. And his fingers just flew across that abacus, moving these little balls back and forth on this wire. And he looked at Gio and he said, I think we can do this. He knew enough about structural engineering to make a few calculations with his abacus. Of course, then he turned it over to people on his team who ran it through the computer. But this guy knew it would work before the computer could finish crunching the numbers. I, I'll never forget that when he pulled that abacus out of his pocket. That was like pure magic. And he worked with Gio Obata and with Bill Valentine. And if there was ever a pure collaboration of design thinking and talent, it was, I was present at a meeting where I could just see Obata and Lynn come up with this brilliant concept of a post-tensioned arch system that meant that even though it's an underground building, instead of looking and feeling like an underground building, it was this lofty arched space with the arches spanning a full 300 feet. And it instantly was the, the right answer for all of us. And the other piece that I really learned something about, you know, heretofore, my experience with contractors had been uh, contractors in a design bid build environment where a contractor didn't come on the scene until after the architect's work was finished and it was bidding time. Boas actually got some very good advice and hired the contractor before he hired the architect. Turner Construction Company. What I learned was, oh, the contractor, they're not the enemy or my opponent, they're my colleagues. Once we learned that we were on the same team during a design, it was a wonderful thing to be able to say, hmm, here's an idea about how to design the foundation. Let's go have a discussion with the contractor and see about the constructability. And I mentioned that because we were down not only 40 feet in the ground, but 20 feet into the water table. So the water pressure on that building inside was serious. And the uplifting pressure from the, from the water was such that we had to find ways to hold the building down to keep it from popping out of the ground. Right. And the one thing I have to remind myself at times, we did this all under the overcast of a lawsuit. That's right. And a strike. We had a carpenter strike in the summer of, uh, I guess it was, uh, I'm going to say 80. But what we were being sued about was that the populace of the city had voted that we could proceed with this project as long as it was undergrounded to the extent possible. Well, the lawsuit was about that we failed to meet that criteria. And so what they did was they, they tried to attack us at the 
environmental impact report and they tried to best to go through those documents and try to show where we were in violation of the edict from the electorate and also from the standpoint of the the fact that we were not following the principles that were outlined in the EIS EIR and so that's that when i say that was the uh, that was the the pall cast over the project and john the people that brought the suit what were they after what did they want nothing that they they just wanted to stop it they they were totally against the development south of market but they were funded by a fellow from the east bay who had considerable financial resources himself but basically it was we we don't want any development south of market street yeah people wanted housing in that part of town they didn't want development that would be business and um there was another group richard grazik he wanted to have a park on the rooftop tivoli gardens tivoli gardens and uh, we actually have some tivoli gardens up there even i think today a carousel and so on but uh so moscone center not only had to be underground but part of the compromise we made was that the roof had to hold a park or buildings up to 3 stories in height anywhere on the rooftop with the location not to be known which was a big giant structural challenge oh yeah and that goes back to TY Lin and his brilliance it was a challenging time but a wondrous time i really grew up as a project manager and as an architect from that experience mostly in learning how to deal with people people outside the office clients the community at large the politicians as well as a contractor that was a new experience for me that left me with a uh, very decided opinions that contractors and architects are natural partners and we should not have separated ourselves from contractors designing and building should be a part of a process they're not you start one and you stop it and you start another one so i learned a lot including that being happy about having a contractor and you know we all became good friends it wasn't the contractor it was joe and tom and it wasn't the architect it was patrick and phil and gio we were just on the same team so the idea of team extending beyond the architects beyond the design team but to be the entire team even the owner was part of that team at the end of it and i think it was because we did a really good job of building that team by being straight with each other and patiently working ourselves through issues and problems as they arose did that become part of the way hok did projects from that point forward it certainly was the beginning i began to advocate in San Francisco where I was you know this was such a good experience to have the contractor on board with us that we should encourage all of our clients to operate this way so we were able to begin a design build movement uh where the contractors on with us in our office and it spread to the other offices of course many clients were just not ready for this they were used to the old way or maybe it was even written into the the law where they were but over the years the use of the contractor and the architect together as a method for designing and building became more and more prevalent because it just makes sense mark it just makes sense why not have all of the players together at the same table instead of having this separation which can be so damaging You eventually became the managing principal of that San Francisco office. How long was it from becoming a project manager till the time where you became a a managing principal of that office and share a little bit of that process? How did that happen and what happened after that? Well, um I was a project manager became a project manager of the biggest the most challenging projects we had. Becoming a managing principal was a just another step. I wasn't thinking about it, but one of the people in our office was called back to St. Louis to help with a real crisis uh, of the firm, uh, one of the first of many uh where we had a cash flow problem and we had some operations problem. 
because of the rapid growth that was beginning around the firm. So he left an opening. Uh, He and Bill Valentine sat me down one day, just quite unexpectedly, and said, I have to go. His name was Bob Stouter. I have to go to St. Louis to help the firm with a great big problem. We'd like you to be the next managing principal. What do you think? I said, well, I'm bowled over. I hadn't thought about it. But of course, I said yes. And I discovered that being a managing principal is a bit like being a project leader. It's just bigger. I would say uh, managing principles, the problems with people to be solved, uh, grow exponentially. You're responsible for an entire office and for the office's relationship with the client community. And from my project management, I learned that, again, managing principles is a misnomer. Yes, there are budgets and schedules and so on, but it's all about leadership. At HOK, all the leaders of the office got little offices uh, that had a glass wall so they could see out, and more importantly, people could see in. Uh, But I learned quickly that I couldn't be in that nice office for very long. I had to be out in the project team area, in the working with people, or having lunch with a client and asking a client, how are we doing? What do you think? Do you have any issues? Most people will not tell you something is bad until it's really bad. But if you ask ahead of time, maybe you can find out something before it gets really out of hand. I call it run toward trouble. If you see an issue in the office or with a client or with a project team, that's a little problem. You can't ignore it. You shouldn't ignore it because little problems have a funny way of becoming big problems. And big problems can turn into disasters. Finally, around the office and finally around the whole firm, people know what run toward trouble means. It became part of the culture. If you have a problem, you don't ignore it and hope it goes away. Your mission is to dive in and fix it, solve it before it gets to be big. But you always have to go looking for it. So there's a lot of joking that Mac Lamey goes around looking for problems. Well, he does. That's part of the job. (laughs) It became part of my leadership style and one that I'm happy to say I was able to successfully impart to others around the office and finally around the firm. Patrick, you said that was part of the culture in that office run toward trouble. Were there certain things that you did to incentivize your team to bring those problems to light? Because I think the instinct that a team has is to hide those problems, right? I made a mistake. I'm going to hide that so nobody sees that. But you really want them to say, I made a mistake. Here's what it is. Let's go figure that out. How do you encourage somebody to do that? Yes, Mark. When people know that they maybe made a mistake, that the impulse is to hide it. Yeah, that's human nature. Human nature. And human nature needs to be countered by giving people permission to fail, creating a culture where we know we're going to make a mistake. All of us do. We make mistakes all the time. It's not making a mistake that's the problem. It's not dealing with the problem and fixing it. If you make a mistake, fix it. If something that's not your doing becomes a problem, fix it. And so it does mean creating a climate where people can and it runs counter to human nature. I agree with you. Uh, but if you create the right climate where people can say, oh, I screwed up. I'm sorry. But here's what we have. What do you think? How can we fix it? If you have the freedom to fail, then you can become a good architect because we all need to be out there at the edge trying to figure things out and fix them and make something happen that's wonderful. How can you do that if you're playing too safe? So I think it's a It's the right culture for a creative uh, enterprise like architecture. Do you have any examples of having to run toward trouble? Yes, I do. (laughs) Hundreds. But uh, there's a couple that are my favorites. We had designed a courthouse in San Bernardino County that's down in Los Angeles area. It was a beautiful project. The client loved it. And uh, it was a kind of a courthouse square with a big lawn in the front. And our landscape architects were responsible for doing the the landscape and the hardscape around the building. And that included a ramp that the sheriff would be using to transport prisoners by bus 
from the county jail to the courthouse on trial day. And the, the ramp went to the basement of the building. And because of the geometry of the streets and so on, it ended up making a right-hand curving turn to enter the building. Well, our landscape architects designed it because it was outside the building envelope. Big mistake. They designed the, the ramp so that it was evenly wide all the way through the turn. Nobody caught the error. But if you take a big, long vehicle of any kind, a bus and, or a long truck, anything, when you get in the middle of a turn, the length of the vehicle means that you actually need more room. Nobody caught it. The building was built. The ramp was built. And the sheriff was ready to transport his first batch of prisoners to the new courthouse. And the driver of the sheriff's bus got stuck in the ramp. Big hullabaloo. So they finally, they got up truck, they pulled the bus out. The sheriff got his best bus driver to try another run, and he got stuck. Well, then it was, you stupid architect, don't you know how to design a ramp? Well, maybe so, but uh, the landscape architects did not. So what did I do? Well, run toward trouble is, I went to the client and the sheriff, and I said, we are at fault. We screwed up. It's our problem, and we're going to fix it. When I said that, people aren't expecting that. Right. Oh, you're actually being honest enough to agree that you screwed up. Oh, it takes all the passion out of it. And people were all prepared and all angry and ready to force me to do something. Here, I, had, I just offered it. We're going to do it. We're going to fix it. All of a sudden, the passion went away. And it was, oh, well, let's coordinate a time when you can come down and we're going to have to do this. And so we ended up hiring the contractor to jackhammer out half of the curve and widen it out at our expense. The schedule for that was coordinated with the sheriff and with the courthouse so that there was as little disruption as possible. And the job got done. And you know, what happened was that because we were frank and admitted error, just like I want people in my own office to say I screwed up, because we did that, the sheriff and the, the court client became best friends and fans. HOK screwed up, but you know, they admitted it and they took care of it. What a lesson. It cost us some money. It, it pinched, it hurt, but we made new friends, really loyal friends, people who said, oh, I trust you because you said what you were going to do and you did it. Mark, that's a huge thing that, again, it's like having employees in the office being able to say, I goofed. You have to be able to say that to your client or your contractor or your consultants or so on. Uh, and when you do, all the passion and the energy kind of drains away. And then it's filled with, how can we help you get it done? Yeah, you earn a lot of respect. You earn a lot of trust from that point forward. You show your integrity as a firm and you lead by example for your team. Your team sees you do that. Uh, and they recognize that, look, there's an example of Patrick running toward trouble when, when it's easy to point fingers and say, oh, it wasn't us, it was somebody else. Precisely. So as as managing principal of that firm, running toward trouble was a significant lesson and a, and a part of the culture that you encouraged there. Did you have other responsibilities as the leader <laughs> of, the, of that office that you had to deal with? Oh, yes. And, and again, you know, leaders – Managing principal, nice sound, got a nice office, nice chair and a table. You also get some of the nastiest jobs. I, I had mentioned that I got my managing principal job because the firm was having cash flow problems and my predecessor was sent to St. Louis to help fix them. Not long after he arrived there, he called me and said, you know, we're asking every office to collect overdue fees from clients. And we had a small project in Malaysia, of all places, where the client had not paid us, and they owed us $200,000. And he said, you know, we really need that money, and we need it to make payroll next week. Wow. So I flew to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, to collect that money. I did it personally. And in those days, Mark, it wasn't easy to get there. You couldn't go directly. I had to take a long flight to Hong Kong on a specially outfitted 747 that actually was called an SP. They had to cut the fuselage off and shorten the plane up to make it lighter so they could actually cross the Pacific. 
I got to Hong Kong, changed planes, flew then to Singapore, changed planes again, and went to finally a little short hop from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Dead tired, but I went to the hotel, showered and shaved, went right to the client office. Got there and well, I'm sorry, we can't see you today. The developer is not here today. Were they surprised to see you there? Oh, yes. So I was told the first day that I showed up, I'm sorry, but our uh, the boss is not here today. You'll have to come back tomorrow. I went to the hotel, took a nap, and came back that afternoon. But we told you the boss wasn't going to be, I'm going to sit here all day until the end of the day because I knew the boss was there. And the boss had to walk through that lobby to get out. And the receptionist did her best to kind of ignore me. I did my best to stay awake. And finally, at the end of the day, the son came out, son of the boss. He said, look, what is it you want? I said, you owe us $200,000. I'm here to collect it. You've had our, our, our invoice for way too long, and we need that money to make payroll. So I'm not leaving until I get the money. He said, you'll have to come back tomorrow. I can't sign those kind of checks. I said, I'm staying until the last person in this office leaves and you kick me out at tonight. Finally, the big boss showed up, came out into the lobby, had the check already written, said, here, there's your money. Now will you please leave? <laughs> so it was a huge lesson for me. And again, a kind of an extension of this run toward trouble. Don't let things fester. Don't let those uncollected bills just lie there. Because the client will be happy if you never ask. They keep the money in their own pocket. And you need that money if you want to have a successful firm and pay your staff. Yeah. And sometimes as a leader, you need to do things that are uncomfortable. And that's running toward trouble. Is, is everything about that story was uncomfortable. What are the lessons that we need to learn from this episode? Well, I think the first and the big one is, if you want to have a successful firm, you have to design a firm that gives young people a chance to stay and to grow instead of having to leave to grow up or seek their career destiny. And that includes giving them a chance to move around geographically. And it certainly includes a career change like I had, which is going from being a designer to being a project manager and then a managing principal. People need that because when they join as a youngster, they don't know. They have to discover what they are. And if you give them that chance in your own firm, that talent will stay with you. In my case, it was for 50 years. Your entire career? Yes, my entire career. The other big lesson, I think, is managing is not leading. Leading is important. It becomes, as you manage bigger groups of people, leadership becomes ever more important. And leadership is mentoring. It's getting out of your office and dealing with people asking a hundred questions and giving people a chance to make mistakes or errors and figure out solutions, not always just doing it for them. And then finally run toward trouble, getting at problems when they're little before they get to be big or before they get to be really firm killers or whoppers. And that means problems in the office, or it might mean a problem with a client or a, a claim or the architect made a mistake as with uh, San Bernardino it's all run toward trouble. It's getting things fixed so that the emotion goes away and trust is restored and we can all get on with being good architects. To continue the story, come back next week for the next episode of Build Smart, where Patrick will discuss the loss of one of the founders, succession, and the challenges that arise during periods of transition. Well, when Helmuth retired, King Graf joined George Casabom and Gio to help run the firm as, again, a troika or a three-person membership group. And then in 1982, I think it was, George Casabom, uh, without warning, he had a brain embolism and uh, woke up complaining of, of a headache, and by the end of the day, he was gone. That sent shockwaves through the firm. He was the anchor, the person that made things work the person that had the relationship with our bank, the person that if clients were unhappy about something, they would go to George and George would do the right things to take care of problems and keep client relationships. And uh, 
people wondered, well, now with George Kassebaum gone, they're just Geo. How is that going to work? Thank you for listening. To read along and see illustrations and personal photos that accompany this series, get Patrick's book, Designing a World-Class Architecture Firm. I encourage you to go grab a copy today and follow along as we continue the story. It's available now at gablemedia.com slash buildsmartbook. This podcast is a Gable Media production and is produced by Demetrius Lynch Jr. Gable Media is the home of curated thought leadership for an audience dedicated to building a better world. You can listen in, subscribe, and find more content like this from our network partners at gablemedia.com. That's G-A-B-L media.com.